began. All right, thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for coming back, those of you who were here for part one. Uh, I'm going to do a recap. I did make some notes because there's, uh, there's some amazing things to share with you. So I'll be referring to this from time to time. I trust that that will be uh, all in order. Uh, where's Bruce? How long ago was it? That, was it August or October last? That I think it was get? October. October, maybe. okay. So that's a, a long time ago. So I am going to recap briefly. And also because of the short time covering part one last time, I had to leave a few gaps. So, uh, but firstly, and most importantly, this is not a story about me. This is a story about God. How God worked in my situation, in my life, to take me out of where I was and bring me here today. Now, where I was, I was very content. I was very happy. I had worked for the same company for 39 years because I was risk averse. <clears throat> I didn't believe in taking risks, particularly when it came to providing for my family. And I'd seen too many cases where aged parents were unable to provide for themselves in retirement and I did not want to do that to my family by taking unnecessary career risks. It doesn't mean that I had a boring job. I had a massive job in a telecommunications company running IT systems. So the systems used by the customers on the website, the systems used by the call center, uh, the systems used to schedule the, the men in the van to go out and attend to your faults. I had to keep those up and running. And it was a massive job because these systems were aging. I had 250 people in my team, $50 million budget. It was a massive job and I enjoyed it. As, despite the pressure, I was very contented in my job. I had a wonderful home. Five kids, four of whom were still living at home. We had a domestic worker who had two grandchildren living on our property. We had a gardener who would come in once a week. So I was happy in the church. I was serving on the deacon's team, had a responsibility for family life. Um, I was in the community. I was chairman of the committee to close off the area from a security point of view put up booms, have guards at gates. I mean, this is how we lived. But I was happy. And uh, at work, um, there'd been a number of occasions where the company, as telecommunications changed over time, was going through downsizing. And they didn't want to do retrenchments because retrenching always had a negative connotation. So they would do voluntary exit packages and they would always surprise you and there was never any advance notice and you could go onto the website and see what sort of cash you could take in your back pocket if you clicked on the apply for early uh, severance button. <laughs> but being risk averse, I avoided that. I didn't even go and look at how much cash I could potentially walk away with because I wanted to secure my job. Now, South Africa was transforming, and there was a policy called affirmative action, which was aimed to redress the racial wrongs of the past by trying to get companies, management structures, to more align with the demographics in the country. But they couldn't fire people, because that would have been discrimination. So you were encouraged, subtly, to apply to leave voluntarily. And this happened year after year and you'd see people around you leaving and suddenly I came to realize I was now the oldest person on my boss's team. All the older guys had left. And you start to look around at these younger people and you feel, although no one says anything, you feel a subtle pressure. You're now the old guy on the team. So when the next round of voluntary packages came in March of 2016, I felt God saying, this is something you need to look at. Now I discussed it with my wife and I was 56 at the time. I had maybe seven, 
eight years of work left. And we had said, after 39 years in the same company, it may be time to do something different. And it would be good if we had the opportunity to go and work overseas for a couple of years and then come back. But that wasn't a guarantee. If I was going to leave my stable, rewarding job at age 56, and I still needed to work, there was no question about no longer generating an income. I had to work. And there was no question that I'd need a job. But if you're 56 and you're a white male, you have major challenges getting a, another job because you don't fit the target profile for management in the company. But by that time, you've got a network of people. They know your skills. And so I had a number of possible feelers for a potential job after I left the company. But it's, it's a massive decision to take. After 39 years, contentedly suckling the bosom of the company, <laughs> to be plucked away was a daunting prospect. So I needed prayer. I needed people to support me in prayer. Just as I was praying for God's leading in this completely out of character thing I was considering doing. And one of the people I asked for prayer was Richard here, sitting next to Bruce. Now, again, Richard and I had met 20 years before. And it was, this was God's hand again, because we both arrived at a meeting of a political party. It was the first time either of us had been at a meeting of this particular political party. We arrived together and found that we had similar intentions. This was a Christian political party which aimed to put people of faith in positions of representation for voters where you could fulfill a Christian calling to serve the people. And we had the same vision. And we ended up journeying together as volunteers in this political party at city level, at state level, and at national level. And we got to work together, and um, I was the chairman of, a federal, of the federal council, he was the secretary general, and we brought a new level of organization, management, and leadership to the organization as volunteers. Richard was fortunate enough to be elected to the local city council as a proportional candidate. So he got the opportunity to serve the community. And he was exactly the type of person that we were offering to voters. People of a Christian conviction, people of integrity, and people of capability. As a qualified engineer, he could speak to the issues of the day which were power stations with aging infrastructure, etc. But Richard, to me, also seemed to be risk-averse and looking after his family and ensuring he had a long-term and stable career. When, eight years ago, he shocked me completely by announcing he's giving up his job for a three-month contract in Australia. I thought the man is crazy. <laughs> what is he doing? Anyway, he ups and leaves. Leaves South Africa and goes to Australia. And the next thing I hear, not only has he decided he's going to stay, but he's now got a permanent position and he's moving his wife across to Australia. This to me was completely crazy. But having journeyed together in politics for 15 or 20 years, you establish a relationship not just between ourselves, but with the people that we worked closely with. And every time he would return for a visit, we would gather people together and just reminisce about the old days and how things are going. So I knew what he was doing in Australia and how it was going. And when I asked him to pray, he said, I'll do that, but let's talk. So we arranged a call and one thing led to another. And the next thing, I had a job offer in Australia. Now, as I mentioned last time, I said no, because 
I didn't want to come to Australia. It wasn't on my radar. 30 years before, Australia was on my radar. And I'd applied for and got a job with Woolworths, based in Sydney in their IT department. But I turned it down. Because one thing about moving country is you break family relationships. I mean, those of you who've moved country know about this. And we didn't feel we could take the grandchildren away from our parents. So I turned it down. And it's interesting to look back and wonder, what would life have been like if I had said yes? I don't have any regrets. No regrets at all. But it's just interesting to ponder, what would life have been like? I had a fantastic 30 years in South Africa as part of the transition from apartheid to democracy and building new relationships with people that I hadn't interacted with in the past. So it was a wonderful opportunity. But Richard had offered me a job in Australia. And although I first said no, God was at work. Because other doors started to close. And I felt a definite sense from God that Australia and this job is what I want you to take. So two weeks after saying no, I said, I'm going to say yes. I feel this is what God wants me to do. Now I imagine, this never happened, but I imagine Richard thinking to himself, okay, I've got to, now he's the CEO of the company. I've now got to go to my board of directors and say, with our global expansion out of, out of Australia and New Zealand to now look after Heathrow and Singapore, I need to fill a current vacancy we have as somebody to run our global support operation. And board of directors, I'd like you to appoint my mate Bruce. <laughs> and the board, I imagined, saying to him, okay, that sounds good, but what are his skills? Now Richard and I had never worked together in a working environment, so I can imagine him saying, well, he chairs a political party <laughs> committee meeting quite well. He knows the Roberts rules of order and he handles it well. And I mentioned the board saying, well, does he have any other skills? Yes, he can handle a meeting of 300 delegates quite well, handling objections and people wanting to speak and overrunning their time. And then I imagine him saying, well, does he really have anything to fit him for this job? And Richard saying, He's great at putting up political party posters. <laughs> no one gets higher on a poll than he does. Now, this would never have worked. So, luckily, Richard phoned my boss, who was the chief information officer, got a work-related reference that he could then take to the board of directors who accepted his recommendation. What is interesting is that he spoke to my boss, the CIO, on the same day the boss introduced me to my replacement. Just to give you, if you have any idea that you're irreplaceable, like I thought I was, <laughs> in a company, you ain't. The same day the boss gave me a reference, I was introduced to my replacement. Now because of the size of the job, there was a two month period in which he shadowed me. And I ran the shop and he shadowed me. In the end of two months, he took over and I consulted. It was very difficult to take your hands off the, the steering column. And those of you who know, I'm now in the aviation industry. And we provide passenger self-service bag drop machines to allow you to drop your bags by interacting with a machine rather than with a person. And so I told my team at the end of the two months when I was now going to move into a consultant role that I'm no longer the captain. I'm going to be the co-pilot and this is your new captain. And when I told him what I would be doing in my new job, some wise guy said, well, from captain to co-pilot to baggage handler. <laughs> You really are moving down the food chain. <laughs> Cheeky guys. 
So, <coughs> you can imagine that for our family and for my wife, this was a massive disruption. I mean, the, the family, these were adult kids, so don't worry, I didn't leave kids in nappies and disappear. These were adult kids, but they were living very contentedly at home because it's, very, it's a lot cheaper to live at home with mom and dad than it is to find your own place and have to do your own washing and cooking. Mm -hmm. And they realized that when mom and dad moved, this is going to seriously disrupt their lives, and they weren't happy. My wife also, or as much as glad as she was to give up her high-pressure job teaching at a high school to boys, um, high school boys, which was very demanding and draining, as glad as she was, she would face the prospect of leaving kids behind, leaving friends behind, leaving the church behind, which is not something easy to do. So my wife reached out to the one person in Australia she knew, which was Rob Zickman, and I introduced him last time. Where's Rob? There. Okay, so my wife had known him 40 years before. They'd been at Bible College together. And uh, that reconnected on Facebook. And uh, so my wife asked Rob, look, my crazy husband wants to uproot us, come to Australia, strange country, we don't know anybody, um, at our age, we'll never fit in, etc. should we come? And without hesitation, he said, come. And he's another person used of God to be part of God's plan to have us here. And that convinced my wife. So we ended up taking the plunge and moving here. The challenge was to get a visa. And I needed one of those famous 457 visas, a skilled temporary visa. And uh, we'd already agreed at what stage I'd leave my previous company and start with a new company, but I didn't have a visa yet. So luckily we were establishing an office in Singapore. So I went to Singapore where you don't need a visa as a South African. I spent what would have been five weeks in Singapore. I had a flight out every Friday on each one of those five weeks expecting the visa to come through. And on Thursday when it hadn't come through, I would go to the hotel and say, Please extend my stay by another week. I'd go to the airline counter, please move my ticket out by a week. So it was quite, when you want to get going and start your new life, to be stuck in Singapore, hot and sweaty and spending weekends in Singapore, it's not a great place to be. You're also missing your home and family, and uh, it's difficult. Now, three weeks into the month, what turned out to be a five-week stay, I never knew you know how long it would be, it turned out to be five weeks. So three weeks into my five week stay, there's this exhibition for passenger terminals and anybody to do with passenger terminals uh, in Asia and they have this exhibition there. And Richard came through there from uh, Sydney and it turned out that on the Monday of the next week was a public holiday in Singapore. So I said to Richard, would it be possible if I checked out of the hotel and instead of the company paying X hundred dollars a night for me to stay in the hotel, I could get that money towards a ticket to South Africa? And he said, yes. So I flew on some via Dubai, uh, via Doha to South Africa. What was special about this was my wife was in hospital having back surgery, serious operation. And as a husband, away from his wife, you kind of feel guilty because you should be there for your wife when she's going through something like this. I like to surprise my wife and I'd like to encourage you guys as well. Don't let the wives think they know everything that's going to happen. <laughs> Let's show them who wears the pants by surprising them. So I didn't tell her I was coming home. The challenge was I had to book this flight ticket and it would ask for a one-time password which was going to her mobile phone. So I said, look, we've got business in Doha, so if you see... Uh, 
something coming through about a flight for Dohots because I'm going there on business. But anyway, I rocked up at the hospital. <laughs> Two kids were walking out as I walked in and they could not believe me. There was dad. And then I surprised my wife and she had a wonderful recovery so that before I left on the Monday, I was able to help her come out of the hospital, move home, and then I hit the airport and came back to Singapore. So again, that was God just taking care of the situation that I found myself in. Eventually, my visa came and I came to Sydney. Now, I'd never been to Australia before. In the last few months while I was still working in my old job, Richard said to me, hey, would you like to come and visit Sydney? And uh, we'll fly you here and you can come. I said, is that for you guys to check me out or me to check you out? And he said, no, no, it's for you to check us out. I said, sorry, I don't have time for that. I'm very busy and I'm coming anyway, so I'll be there. So this was the first time I've ever been in Australia. Again, God's foresight. Our best man from our wedding in South Africa 30 years ago was now living in Sydney. And he didn't realize it, but in the fine print of his appointment contract as best man, it said provide accommodation for the bridegroom in Sydney in 30 <laughs> years' time. So he had two daughters living with him, so the only room they had was an outside room, which they had, he and the other best man had done their best to equip and make it homely. Again, God's foresight, the exact five weeks between then and Christmas that I was working in, Sing in Sydney, his daughter was overseas, so I got an upgrade to a room in the house, which was very fortunate. So, the company, I was here on my own till after Christmas and eventually my wife arrived on Australia Day in 2017. And the company had been very generous to equip, allow us to have two months B and, uh, Airbnb accommodation in Coogee. Now, this was the first time I'd been to Coogee and uh, it was a very nice apartment, one block from the beach. And so, we settled down to life in Coogee, but the challenge was we needed to find a long-term apartment rental. Now we had spent a lot of time on realestate.com looking at areas. The company is based in Botany, so we wanted to live within public transport, uh, reasonable public transport of Botany. Now because we'd lived inland for the last 20 years, I really wanted an apartment with a, a water view. I didn't mind if it was inland water or sea, as long as I had a water view. And there's a lot of water in Sydney, so I felt my prospects of getting a place with a water view were reasonably good. My wife wanted something which was light, white and bright. Those were the words she felt in her heart was what she wanted. Something not gloomy or dull or anything like that, something with life in it. So we set about trying to find an apartment which met those criteria. And we would look on realestate.com.au, but you don't get a sense of the areas. And I was looking in Rose Bay and Neutral Bay and Double Bay and Manly and Botany Bay and all of these bays trying to find an apartment, but I didn't know the areas. So one day I signed up for a walk. It's one of these meet-up walks where interested people, somebody volunteers to lead it. Interested people sign up. And this was a walk from Walla Creek to Cronulla. That sounds like madness, but cycling to Canberra also <laughs> sounds like madness. <laughs> so I signed up. And this was the first time I'd ever seen any of those suburbs along Botany Bay. So I would walk along, take a photo. This is... Uh, whatever the suburb was, send it to my wife, next one, um, Ramsgate, take a photo, send it to my wife. So we got a sense of the area and it was nice walking along and around Botany Bay. Then we walked up the hill to Wonder Beach and I saw, what's it, Bait Bay. And that was such a beautiful sight compared to the flatness of Botany Bay to come over that crest and see 
Beit Bay. I realized this is a beautiful place to live. But the challenge was, in our two months, the last three weeks of the two months, we were going to be overseas and come back with three days and have to be out of the Airbnb. So we had to secure a rental before we left to go overseas. And in South Africa, if you want a rental, you phone up an estate agent, you say, look, I'm in the market for some rentals. Uh, this is my price range. Uh, organize a couple of uh, viewings for me and uh, fit my schedule and I'll pop in and have a look. Well, we realized in Australia, it don't work that way. <laughs> we got a massive shock when we went to our first viewing. When there were 30 people <laughs> all interested in one rental. And we realized this is a massive challenge. We don't have a rental track record in, in um, Australia. We don't have a credit history in Australia. So this is definitely a matter for God. And in one of the first weekends that we could have gone viewing, I'd arranged for my wife as a newly arrived person in Australia to go on a helicopter flip around. So we went on black something helicopter flip. And there was one apartment which had been advertised for viewing that week, which had a nice sea view, looked white, but because of our helicopter flip, we missed the viewing. And the next weekend, when we had lined up seven places to view, that particular apartment was no longer listed. Now, we had realized, having now got a sense of you know, the cost of living in Sydney versus the income that Richard was paying me as a migrant. <laughs> he was abusing me and all of that. So what had originally been our pitch for the level at which we wanted to take a rental, we had to drop. And by then I'd said to my wife, listen, let's forget water view, light white and bright. Let's just get something that we can at least secure so that when we come back from overseas, we have a place to stay. So we viewed seven houses or seven apartments the one day. We put in an offer for a place in Cronulla, but two blocks up from the beach, a place in Bando, and we didn't get it. So we were extremely disappointed. The agent said, look, sorry, you don't have a track record of rental. You don't have any local references, etc., etc." So my wife was extremely disappointed. So she wasn't going to help look the next Saturday. So I had to compile the list of seven apartments to go and view. And then on the Thursday she came and said to me, it's back. I said, what's back? You remember that apartment with the sea view? It's back. It's available for viewing. But I insisted we still looked at my seven list, but we added that to the list. So we went through all of them. By this time, I'd realized I needed references. So I approached Richard as the CEO of an Australian company. The fact he'd only been in Australia six years, we didn't mention at all. But he was able to write a reference letter, and then we approached Rob, the, baris the barrister, not barista, the barrister. Maybe we're the barrister today. Although he'd only known my wife 40 years ago and hadn't seen her since, they had established a relationship on Facebook, and he could see that she was still walking her spiritual calling, and on that basis, he credited me with some of her spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like what, what happens in heaven, that we have r imputed righteousness. But thank you, Rob. And he wrote a letter as a barrister. So armed with that, we were ready to put in offers. And we offered on three places. This apartment, which was light, white, and bright with a, a sea view. And when my wife walked into that apartment, she just started crying because she felt this was exactly what we'd been looking for. And on the Monday we heard we got apartment number two because we put them in order uh, of our preference. So this light white and bright with the sea view was our number one. But we got number two 
and number three was from the same agency, and so number three fell away. And then we had an anxious few hours of prayer before God on the Monday to hear whether we got number one. And about three o'clock in the afternoon, we heard we had got number one. So God, in His faithfulness, see you light, white, and bright. Fantastic. And I thank God for that. And you would have thought that now... Um, no, there's one other thing. So we moved in at the end of March 2017. And uh, my wife had said, look, she's come to Australia. She's willing to come for this adventure, but she doesn't intend to make friends here. All her friends are back in South Africa. Those of you who have changed city and changed country may, may be aware this is the kind of thing, particularly a wife who is no longer working. I buzzed off to work every day. I was busy there. I met people, etc. But she was at home. And she had no intention of making friends, of seeking out people to make friends. Now, in our apartment block, there had been uh, the Strata Committee who had helped us uh, move our stuff in and, you know, all of that sort of thing. And one of the women had been particularly helpful. I'm not going to mention her name because she was here at the church. And uh, I just sent her a text message on the Monday when I was at the office. I said, thank you very much for all the assistance you gave us. Really appreciate it. And why don't you pop up and, and visit my wife? So um, <clears throat> the woman said, okay, I'll do that. And uh, so she popped up to visit my wife, who invited her in for tea. And uh, they got chatting. And the woman said to her, you know, how did you come to get this apartment? Because they are so scarce and so selective about who they rent to. Um, how did you get it? And my wife said, well, I'm going to take the plunge. I'm going to just tell her this is what God has done. And so she told the story of how we'd come to get the apartment. And this woman got tears in her eyes and said, you know, I've been praying for seven years for a Christian friend in this apartment block. And you, a migrant from Africa, are that friend. And that really gave my wife stability in a foreign country. And they become good friends. They don't live in each other's pocket, but the lady was able to take her to um, Spotlight. And um, what's that Swedish place? Ikea. 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 And all these important Vinnies. My wife loves Vinnies. <laughs> Salvos. So local knowledge really helped my wife settle in to life in Australia. And the fact that we have an apartment with a sea view and we can hear the sea all night is also been God's amazing blessing at facilitating our adaptation to a new country. I feel like I'm on holiday when I arrive home and I see the sea in front of me because I only went to the sea on holiday. And it's really God's blessing and favor, undeserved, unmerited. And you would think that in a new job which I was enjoying and um, a nice apartment in that, that I had arrived now. I could see out my 457 visa, get um, PR, and ultimately become a citizen. And Richard had done that um, six years. He was kind of six years ahead of me in that process. And you would have thought I had no need of God anymore because he'd done his bit and I was now settled. In April, we have a situation where it's not, but God did this. It's, but Peter Dutton did this. <laughs> Peter Dutton announced radical changes to the migration policy. And migrants, people have strong feelings about migrants. And uh, he had sensed that they needed to tighten up on how the system was working. And uh, one can understand that. I mean, one doesn't want cultures and your sort of communities to develop which become isolationist and don't adopt the Australian way of life. So you can understand why they started to clamp down on this. The challenge was new policies have impact on people. And I was one of those people who was directly impacted by the changes. When you get that sinking 
feeling in your stomach. You'd given up your job, you'd migrated countries, and now for two reasons, the pathway out of a temporary resident status to permanent, to citizenship, was now blocked. I was too old, and instead of having one skilled job list, they had created two, a short term and a long term. The sh and they'd split the jobs into two. My job was now on the short term list, and there's no pathway to permanent residence for jobs on the short list. So overnight, Peter Dutton had now put a stop to my hopes and my dreams. Although we came to Australia with the intention to work here for a few years and go back and retire in South Africa, we wanted to work here for more than four years, which was all my temporary visa allowed me. So now we were in this situation of being in trouble. So I approached an immigration lawyer, a doctor of immigration law, paid good money for a consultation. He went through all the possible options I had, and each one we had to say, no, you don't have a million dollars to invest. No, you don't have the balance of your family already here. No, you don't meet this. And right at the end, when we were about to walk out, I told him what I did. I told him that I'm in a company which has got an innovative and unique, relatively unique product. We are making inroads internationally, and as a result, we are employing more Australians. He said there may be a 1% chance that we could do a labor, use a labor agreement to, because of that scenario, we may be able to get you permanent residence. But I still had three and a half years to see out my visa, so there was time. Um, that I couldn't apply for permanent residence until I'd worked for four years. So there was no need to do anything drastic at the moment. But it's still, you walk around with a sinking feeling of worry and concern in your stomach because what you'd hoped for is not going to materialize. So I was sharing it with somebody like Rob, who, he's a barrister of construction law. So if you ever need somebody to mediate in a dispute with a builder, or you are a builder and you've got a dispute with a client, he is your man. But he's not afraid to consult on international migration either. <laughs> it's not his field, but he'll give you his opinion. So he says, consult your local MP. You, in his constituency, you should approach him with your situation. But we didn't know who our local MP was. <laughs> until I was walking in the Cronulla village. And there I saw in big letters, Scott Morrison MP. <laughs> and that same week I got one of his Cook Community brochures, which had his contact details and inviting anybody to approach him if you had any issues. So me and my international migration consultant <laughs> thought that is exactly what we do. So I penned a letter to Scott Morrison, which I'm going to read some highlights to you. And this is crazy, this migrant from Africa writing to Scott Morrison, the Minister of Finance at the time. So my first letter bounced back. There's obviously an automated email filter which tries to see, are you in his constituency or not? And there wasn't enough information to show that I was in his constituency, so I sent a follow-up letter. I said, Dear Mr. Morrison, please don't try to look me up on the voters' roll for Cook, as you won't find me there. I plan to be there in future, but at the moment I reside in Cronulla, and as a result I received your recent Cook Community Courier. I'd already been planning to approach you, as suggested by a barrister friend of mine, and I'd seen your office in Cronulla. Your Cook Community Courier, with your statement that you are here to help, was the incentive to me to pen this email to you. In a nutshell, the situation I find myself in is as follows. I've been in Australia on a four-year 
457 visa for just over a year. This was in uh, December of 2017, I wrote this. When I accepted the offer of a position from the sponsoring company, ICM Airport Technics, and I gave the company website there, just in case he wanted to see if we were bona fide or not. Um, a key factor was the existence of a transitional pathway beyond the four-year 457 visa to permanent resident citizenship. While this pathway is not guaranteed, there is a re was a reasonable expectation that unless I disqualified myself through unacceptable, unacceptable behavior, I would be able to transition to PR and onto citizen. Whilst this was a key factor in my decision to relocate myself and family to Australia, it was only after I experienced the quality of life in Australia that the opportunity to become a permanent resident and a citizen became a burning desire. You can therefore imagine the shock I experienced when the drastic changes to the 457 visa were announced by Minister Dutton in April 2017. Myself and others in the same situation, and I joined various groups in, on Facebook, and I even volunteered to speak at a rally. They turned me down, but never mind. <laughs> uh, we were anxiously awaiting to see whether any grandfathering options, which is a legal mechanism to protect people or who get affected by legislation, which affects their situation. That's called grandfathering, which kind of gives you the same rights that you had before they changed the, the law. Um, so we were looking for grandfathering options just to continue to allow me to progress to PR. To date, Minister Dutton has generously ensured that 457 visa holders at the time of the change, aged younger than 50, and even those who merely applied at that date, would continue to have subs substantially the same opportunities for permanent residence and citizenship. So they'd grandfathered for the under 50s, but there was no mention for the over 50s. Um, yeah, so I said, in summary, I'm requesting your help to ensure that Minister Dutton also grants 457 visa holders older than 50 similar grandfathering. At a personal level, because at the end of the day, the impact of legislative and regulatory changes impacts affected people at a personal level, Please have a look at my LinkedIn profile. So this is very, very cheeky. You've got to admit, I'm inviting the Minister of Finance to look at my LinkedIn profile. But I was on a roll. And also at, <laughs> at the, a website called Who's Who in South Africa, and because of my involvement in politics, I've somehow been invited to put my profile on Who's Who in South Africa. So because I was on a roll, I threw that in for good measure. <laughs> and then I continued, I said, I would like to inform you that I'm becoming fully assimilated into Australian society. Rather than live in an enclave amongst other ex-South Africans, my wife have chosen to live in Cronulla in order to meet Australians, which we are succeeding in doing. I'm proud of the fact that I have a Cronulla Shocks supporter shirt. <laughs> 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 and I watched the final game in the state of origins in Northeast Pub, which was very disappointing. <laughs> I'm following the first Ashes Test against England, the Australian Open Golf Tournament, and watching a replay of Australia versus Scotland in Rugby Union. Oh yes, I also attended the National Conference of the Australia Christian Lobby last weekend here in Sydney. All true, by the way. So, in summary, I'd like to suggest that it would be a real loss for the Cook community and Australia if the recent visa changes were to deny me the opportunity of making a future life here in Australia. Very cheap. <laughs> Finally, something which is completely irrelevant to my request, but something you may find interesting, is the fact that I served in a voluntary capacity for five years as the national chairman of a Christian political party in South Africa. I gave the website so I have the utmost respect for the work you do and the societal responsibilities placed on you. Um, I didn't get a reply, so I sent a follow. I said, just a word of, now, I think I followed him or my wife had um, pointed me to a website quoting one of the speeches he made. 
So I said, um, just a word of congratulations on your speech regarding the same-sex marriage bill. My wife sent me a copy of your speech and I applaud your bold stand for your faith and the balanced and fair approach you've taken in your speech. As a South African, I liked your reference to Archbishop Tutu, who was a very South African uh, anti-apartheid campaigner. And I said, I once had the incredible opportunity at, at the 80th birthday party of a famous South African lawyer, George Bezos, to be seated at the table next to Archbishop Tutu, the sitting president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, and ex-president and global icon, Nelson Mandela. And that's a true story. We were sitting at this table next door. So anyway, I just sent that, that to him. And then hmm. I received this. Dear Mr. Harbour, I refer to your letter regarding your inability to apply for a permanent residency due to the changes made to the subclass 457 visa. As promised, I've made the representations on your behalf to the Honourable Peter Dutton MP, Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, requesting he review your correspondence and provide a response. I'll be in contact with you once again. Uh, I'll contact with you again once the response is received. 24th of December 2017. Unfortunately, I didn't get a reply from Peter Dutton, not personally, but in January he did announce that the over 50s would also be grandfathered, which was an amazing answer to prayer. <laughs> However, it's not clear cut, so the company lawyer is very conservative. So as much as I've been, you know, in consultation with her about the fact that according to this I should be eligible to apply and they've reduced the four-year wait to three years, so November this year I should be able to apply for PR. I picked up on a website this week, they were saying after two years can apply, so I approached her with that uh, situation yesterday, asked her for a comment. She replies, quoting all the reasons why in the legislation I can't. And right at the bottom, she has this little one line. And so I'm reading this, and again, I'm getting that sinking feeling in my stomach. This lawyer is telling me there's no chance because you're over 50. Right at the bottom, she quotes the exemption for over 50 who, achieve, who are, have been working and earning above a certain threshold. So I meet <laughs> that exemption criteria. So after the initial sinking feeling, I was very pleased to see that exemption still applies. So I'm trusting for November that, uh, that uh, I can then apply. So here I am today. Uh, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. I thought the job I had in South Africa where I had a national responsibility from one side of the country to the other was a big job until I took this job. Now I'm having to deal with the top airports of the world. It is a global job. It's incredibly humbling to be part of a company which is providing services to Heathrow, um, China, uh, Singapore airport, airports in China, soon in Japan and that. It's a massive job. I'm really enjoying it. It's tough. It's a challenge. I'm working for a boss who is sold out on global dominance in our industry. So I kind of get swept up in that. And, uh, but it's an exciting part to be. But at the end of the day, it's not about me being here because I, I, God wanted me to have a great job. It's, it's part of it. That's true. But my wife and I are asking ourselves, what is the spiritual purpose for us to be here? Why did God want us to be here? So we are in a journey to find that out. In all I've told you so far, there was never a voice from heaven saying, apply for voluntary early retirement. A voice saying, go, this is the apartment I have for you. God doesn't speak to me that way. So don't think that I'm some super spiritual guy who hears from God and it's like that. It's definite. God works in strange ways. He works in our heart and He works in the circumstances around us. And this is what um, Mark refers to as the fingerprints of God and what uh, Rob refers to as looking back in the rearview mirror to see how God has been at work ordering your path, ordering your circumstances. And 
So my story is one of faith. Just being sensitive to where you feel God is leading you. And taking that step of faith. So here we are in Australia. We like Australians. Contrary to the image your cricketers portray on the TV, you're actually really nice people. We've enjoyed the opportunity to come over here and get to know you. We've started to get involved in ministry opportunities which have presented themselves. My wife is playing in the church, which is, again, a wonderful restoration of a ministry that she'd for various reasons, no longer been able to fulfill in South Africa. And God has blessed her with that opportunity. So we are waiting on God and seeing what is His purpose. Now, when we came here, it was with the intention to go back. But it's a really great quality of life here in Australia. And if we can, we would like to stay. The challenge is we've got five kids back in South Africa. And as hard as we are trying to encourage them to come, they are still stuck in their little bubbles and not willing. The youngest is on our visa, so he should be coming. But the four girls are not coming. And that, that is a challenge because as we grow old, we want to be where our children are and our grandchildren are. And this remains a matter for prayer. You ask me, where do you see your future? I don't know. I look through the, the driver's window and I don't know. But I do know who's got my life and my future in his hands. And so I can look back and see his, the, way he has, the way he has led us and the doors he's opened. So I take confidence in that. I don't stress. I don't worry. Because God is at work. And he will take care of the future. If I trust in him. And I listen to him. So pray for us. We can't really afford to retire in this country. Because all of that massive money that I was given. Is worth very little in this country. When you convert it. Because of a weak exchange rate. That's why I need kids here to fund me. <laughs> I keep telling the kids, they owe me big time. All the times I used to fetch and carry them from this event and that event, they're going to pay back when I'm old and take me here and wheel me down the esplanade and what have you. So it's going to be payback, but they've got to be here. So we don't know where the future is, is going to, what the future holds and where we're going to end up. But thank you to each one of you because... It's fantastic. It's a real adventure. It's really exciting to be journeying together with you for these years that we are together, based here at the church, um, at, at ICM, friends who are not in the church. It's a real privilege to be part of you. And I look forward to how this adventure unfolds. So let's just close in a word of prayer as I pray for all of us. Father, we thank you that... We don't have to be spiritual supermen to know and experience you at work in our lives. And Lord, as I've shared from a, a place of being completely risk averse to hearing you, of following the openings that you've made, and just being blessed by you and astounded by your provision, I pray that for every man represented here, Lord, that we would seek your face we would seek to allow you space to work in our lives and to direct our paths for the purposes of your kingdom. Use us, we pray, to further your kingdom here in this part of the world. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.